Welcome back to AI in Medicine, part five, lecture one. In this lecture, we'll be talking about data sharing and ethics. Okay, a quick overview for part five. We're gonna talk about ethics and fairness in the first lecture, and then we'll finish it up with data ownership and regulatory implications in lecture two. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about ethics more specifically ethical treatment of patients in our research and the ethical treatment of humans dates back to the Nuremberg trials following the Second World War where war criminals were on trial for their unethical behavior. So ethical behavior would be fair, fairness uh, according to a moral standard of the society you live in. In our case, as machine learners dealing with data, we need to make sure that the use of the data is ethical, so meaning it's fair, and it abides to the moral standard of our society. Now, in our case, um, you know, patients need and deserve the opportunity to control their health data. Now, of course, the health data, the primary use is healthcare, but the secondary use is is us. It's researchers who need access to the data for legitimate research. So the first problem we encounter is accountability. And so we're going to talk about what this means in terms of ethical behavior. So accountability essentially means if something we develop as uh, an AI machine learner fails in the future, who will be held responsible? And one has to keep in mind that as AI designers and developers, we are ultimately responsible when we are considering the AI design, the development, the decision process, you know, what outcomes we use, how we validate, how we verify. And on top of that, human judgment also plays an important role because we are humans and we are the ones who are writing the algorithms and we define what is success and what is failure. So this is where the moral standards come into play. You need to be sure that whatever software, whatever algorithm you develop is in accordance to those moral, moral standards. And in our case, because we're dealing with medicine, even though we are or appear to be removed from the clinic, the tools that we develop will be in clinic. And so we therefore uh, are accountable to the same um, standards, if you wish, that the medical community abide to. So what does this mean when we talk about accountability then? Bottom line, it means that whoever makes decisions about the uses of the systems we develop and who may be affected by these systems is going to be accountable. Every person involved in the creation of the AI solution at any step is also accountable for at least considering the system's impact in the world. And that's an important point because very often you'll have um, AI machine learners who are really very focused at what they do and they don't necessarily think about the what we would call the knowledge translation so meaning you know how is the product that they're contributing to going to impact uh this you know society essentially and so what i think is important is that no matter who is on your team everyone should be allowed to and encouraged to participate in those decisions that help to shape the product overall so how do we deal with this accountability? Well, it's extremely important to make sure that there are clear and accessible company or academic team policies that, that guide the design and development teams. Everybody in the team must know their responsibilities. And ultimately, it is also extremely important to understand where the responsibility of the company, software company, academic team, um, begins and ends 
because this provides kind of a comfort zone or a safe zone for doing your work and your research and not being worried, oh, I'm not sure if I'm, you know, if this is going to be something that's going to uh, ultimately uh, end up in my lap if it goes wrong. Now, remember, there may not be any control over the data that's being used. It's possible, maybe open source, public data. Uh, or there may not be control over the tool that will be then used by a user client. So what's important is to document. Documentation, documentation, documentation. Detailed records of your design, how, how the design came to be, um, if there was any changes to the, to the design, what were those changes? Why did you, uh, did you verify them, validate them? And keep these records uh, from the entire process. And all of this is your way of showing that you followed the company or the national or the international guidelines that are required for you to not only work ethically, but to produce a product um, that will in itself be ethical in its application. Okay, let's move on to value alignment. So what do we mean by value alignment? Well, with machine learning and artificial intelligence, there's this idea that we're going to be developing autonomous entities or agents. Now, if we are, and all of these agents will be operating in our society, why would we not expect those agents to abide to the same societal and moral norms or standards that we do? We should, after all. And that is where value alignment comes in. Now, to date, as, as I'm sure you've noticed in the news, um, there isn't that much. It's not obvious, but there is already the IEEE Global Initiative on Ethics of Autonomous and Intelligent Systems, but we don't necessarily need uh, to go and look that up in order for us when we're developing an AI ML uh, solution um, to at least begin with what would be appropriate uh, ethically, morally, if you wish, um, for this agent or new software to operate in a clinical setting. That's a pretty easy one because we can just make sure it is abiding to the same standards that we do as either clinicians or scientists or researchers or whoever is involved in the process. So more specifically, make sure that the AI do, you develop is designed to align with the norms and values of your user group in mind. So it's the same as in statistics, what's the population you're generalizing to? Well, in this case, it's, you know, what's the population you're going to be setting your AI uh, solution loose in, right? Just make sure it does align with um, that group that you have in mind. Bottom line is, is making sure that your software is in tune or aligned with the cultural norms uh, in the society that it's going to operate. And if you, you know, the easy way to remember that is that it makes the same judgment calls on what is right and what is wrong as do the users uh, from your groups. Now remember, AI algorithms do not have experiences upon which to draw in order to make the decision if it's right or wrong. So designers and developers must consider values of the user group of interest in order to create the ideal AI system. And that means that you know care is required to make sure that there's sensitivity to the wide range of cultural norms and values that generally operate in a population. So how do we go about doing all of this? Well, as we just mentioned, inevitably you can consider the culture um, and the value system within the user group you're considering. Um, the other uh, very important point is to get different perspectives, you know, from policymakers, from academics, from uh, key opinion leaders, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you can map out the general understanding of all the values. Uh, and just don't forget that values are subjective. 
uh, and so therefore they will differ globally. So meaning what makes sense to you here may not make sense to you. In, it makes sense in Europe or, or in, in, you know, Australia or in Asia. And that is just very important to consider when you're in the design phase. Now, something that is often overlooked is the input, the feedback from the ultimate end user, which is the patient. You need the trust and approval from patients in order for your algorithm to be successful in a clinical setting. Correct decision making is a function of the structure of the data used as input. And therefore, you need to nurture that relationship between clinicians who understand the specifics of the clinical data and the developers who are creating the algorithms. Okay, next let's tackle explainability. So often referred to in the machine learning world as the black box problem. So why does there need to be explainability? I mean, if the algorithm simply works with a high accuracy of 99%, is that not enough? Well, I guess in a sense it could be, right? But the challenge is you wanna make sure that everything you did and everything you're doing is ethical. So I mean, it's abiding to the moral standards of your society. Well, in order to do that, you're going to have to explain how your algorithm works. What's the decision making process that exists in your algorithm? And to do that, you need to be able to explain how it works. And this in return will provide transparency or confidence or ultimately trust in your algorithm. So because these algorithms are going to be used with humans, then humans need to understand how this algorithm works. And that's the challenge is how much needs to be understood um, to provide the level of trust that's required. Because as you know, uh, because it's an extremely complex process that the machine learning is helping us um, deal with, it is extremely difficult to explain everything the algorithm is doing. So we have to find that kind of happy in between where we provide some reasoning that's enough for us to have trust in the algorithm. So some good practices in order to achieve this explainability is to ask a lot of questions and they should be asked in, during the entire process of the development of the AI solution. There also needs to be the, the option, the possibility for review. So meaning we, you need to be able to go back and say, this is how I did it. This is, you know, where we got the data. This is what we did to abide to all of the ethical uh, requirements that were laid out by the research ethics board. Um, and you need to hang on to that documentation because you never know it may come back uh, when someone wants to ask you when they're assessing uh, your algorithm. And of course, this is especially important when you're dealing with, uh, you know, highly sensitive uh, personal data. Okay, moving on to fairness. So why should we be concerned about fairness? Well, AI that is built by us humans inevitably leads to the chance for our biases to be found in the systems. And so AI has to be designed to minimize this bias and to be as inclusive as possible. So I am sure you have heard of many examples of where products are put out into the market and it is later found out that there are biases in those products due to where and by who um, the product was developed. Let's look at the unconscious or shortcut biases. The first one is kind of an obvious one. It's called the availability bias. And that's where you have overestimation of certain events uh, due to their greater availability. Uh, there's the base rate fallacy, which is tendency to ignore general information and focus on very specific information. And the congruence bias, which is the tendency to test hypotheses exclusively through direct testing, which means testing of your initial hypothesis instead of testing alternative hypotheses. 
So, but that that's a good one because what happens is, is you have your initial hypothesis, you test it, woo, all right, it worked out, fantastic. You know, you do a little dance and your little happy dance, and then what do you do to, when someone comes to you goes, oh, have you really have you checked that? You go. Oh, okay, no, I haven't, but I will. And then you go back and you test the exact same hypothesis again. And oh, of course, yay, you get the same result. Oh my God, that's it, it's done. Um, sadly, what you should be doing is also testing those alternative hypotheses uh, from those people that you would be calling cynical. Oh, you, you're so cynical. Why would you ever say that? You know, well, you should, you should. I mean, you should, that's when you should be listening to those critical friends of yours and saying, okay, well, you know what? Maybe I will test that hypothesis. I won't tell him or her, but I'm going to test it anyway and see if, you know, uh, they're right or wrong. It, that is very important to do because what it does is it, it definitely, um, validates, you know, your, your algorithm in a much more generalizable way. One more, the empathy gap bias. This is the tendency to underestimate the influence or strength of feeling in either one's self or other. The last one, stereotyping. I'm sure you guys know that one. It's expecting a member of a group to have certain characteristics without having actual information about that individual. Those two uh, biases can kind of creep in depending on your sampling. Okay, let's talk about impartiality biases. The anchoring bias, and this is where you rely too much on one thing, one trait or one piece of information when making decisions. The bandwagon bias, I'm sure you guys have uh, heard of this one, especially when the um, Maple Leafs, um, you know, enter the, the playoffs and everyone jumps on the bandwagon, so to speak. And this is tendency to do or believe things because many other people do. And that's a, that's a good one. Uh, the um, blind spot bias. Uh, this is the tendency to see oneself as less biased than others uh, or to be able to identify more cognitive biases in others than in oneself. This is a good one. I mean, it, you know, everyone tends to have a blind spot and that is where you appreciate having people who think differently on your team. It's not always pleasant, right? So you always want everybody to agree all the time and, you know, and then you have these wonderful meetings where everyone just says, yes, yes, that's wonderful. Um, but it's, it's good to have that, that person who just doesn't think like you, uh, very different in, in their approach of, of making decisions. And that's where you're truly going to be able to uh, avoid and actually be made aware of your blind spot. Now, these two biases, I think, can affect anyone. Uh, the first one is the confirmation bias, and that's the tendency to search for or focus on information uh, that confirms your preconception. So essentially, you, you have an idea, you have a hypothesis, you look for ways to confirm it. I think it's just natural for people to do that. But you, you definitely need to be aware of that one because you'll catch yourself doing it. The next one is the, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid. So the, the halo effect. So it's the tendency of an overall impression, especially a positive one, that's going to basically, um, you know, embellish you know, how you feel about everything in the project. So even if you have areas that are a little ambiguous uh, or, or, you know, could be viewed as negative or not quite supportive of what you're doing, you can be like, eh, you know, overall, it's all good. Everything's good. You know, it's just a little bit of a problem. Let's just ignore it. Uh, and that one's, that one is, is, you know, leads to when you, you get, when you get bit, you know, you, you, you push it to the side, you ignore it. Uh, and then it comes back to to haunt you later on in the project. Okay, let's jump into self-interest biases. So you have the in-group, out-group bias, and that's the tendency or pattern of favoring members of one's in-group, so meaning the cool group versus the out-group. Uh, this is a tough one, of course, right? But it it, you know, once again, everybody can be um, susceptible to this type of bias. And it's just important for you to keep in mind that you need to be fair. The sunk cost bias. Now this is a tough one, you know, tendency to justify past choices, uh, even though they're no longer uh, valid, right? And that is the more you're vested in something, the more you're going to want to make sure it works. And that's just, that's, you know, everybody would, would suffer from that one. I think it's important for you to understand or to realize when it's time to draw the line and say, you know what? Um, nope, 
<laughs> we can't we can't keep believing that this is going to work or or end up working uh, just because we've set, you know sunk so much time and money into the project. The status quo bias is the tendency to maintain the current situation even when a better alternative may exist. That's also a tough one because you're kind of realizing, wow, I spent so much time on this project and I think it's really cool, but I have this suspicion that there's a better way to do it and it's being done in another lab, you know, or in another company. And you're like, no, 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 I can't believe that. Um, that's, I mean, that's a tough one as well. Does it mean that your project's over? No, there are ways to, to get around that because there's also, you know, addressable market, right? So you can always look at that. I mean, your, your solution may still be viable in uh, or under certain circumstances. And that's where you need to pay attention to the status quo bias and make sure that, uh, you revisit, you know, the generalizability of what you're doing on a regular basis. Let's finish off the self-interest biases. Uh, this is always a good one. The not invented here bias, and that's the aversion to come into contact with or use, uh, use uh, products or, or research knowledge developed that's outside of your group. Um, is this a problem? Yes, of course, because you, you in research, you want to move the state of the art forward. And in order to do that, you should systematically look everywhere um, for what is needed for you to do your research best. Uh, the last one, the self-serving bias. I, I think this is, once again, it's kind of a natural bias. And that's the tendency to focus on strengths and achievements and overlook faults and failures. Uh, is this a problem? Yes, yes. Once again, it's a problem because, in my opinion, you tend to learn a lot more from uh, looking at your failures than you do your achievements. So, most importantly, how, what's the, what are the steps to resolve bias? Now, if there is bias, the team must investigate and understand where it came from and how can you fix it. And it sounds simple, but then there has to be a process in place to trigger it, meaning to, to become aware of it and then to investigate it, to understand it, and then to fix it. So there has to be a process in place. Now, algorithm design and development should happen without intentional biases, of course. And there needs to be regular team reviews in order to avoid unintentional biases. For instance, all the ones that we just went through. So to do that, you have to cre create some form of feedback mechanism um, for you to continually assess and check and fix. And most importantly, there must be an open dialogue with users, team members, everybody involved must feel comfortable to come forward and say, hmm, you know, I've been thinking about our project and I have a feeling, you know, we have this kind of bias going on. You don't want to, you know, to, to say, oh, why did you come forward or get mad at them or, you know, shh, don't tell anybody, you know, uh, that's not the right approach for sure. For sure. That will come back to bite you. And that's it for the first lecture of part five. Next up, lecture two on data ownership and privacy. See you there.